Hey, we just uh, want to welcome you again to Prairie Lakes Church on this beautiful, warm, uh, spring is coming, Iowa weekend, uh, which is pretty crazy, right? Because uh, it seems like just yesterday we were shivering at 20 below, um, and now here we sit staring down 50 degrees. Uh, of course, knock on wood, knock, knock on wood. <laughs> right? Don't talk about how nice the weather is. Don't you dare. Uh, it can still snow. It can still get cold. Don't jinx it. You know, don't jinx it. Um, I, think if, uh, I think if 2020 had a t-shirt, I think that's what it would say. I, it would say like, don't, don't jinx it. <laughs> uh, coronavirus numbers are down. Don't jinx it. Uh, kids are going back to school in more places. Don't jinx it. Mask mandates are expiring. Don't jinx it. Uh, for the first time in over a year, for the first time in over a year, my wife and I are actually planning a trip. We're going to hop on a plane in about a week or so for a, for a combined birthday slash wedding, 15-year wedding anniversary trip. We're going we're gonna to try to make it to Florida for some Yankees spring training baseball and beach and everything else. But from the moment we first started uh, planning this trip, envisioning it, you know, uh, from, uh, from that to the plane tickets, to the hotel reservation, game tickets, all of that. You know what we did from the moment we first thought about it? We, uh, we just made sure that uh, in any scenario, we could get our money back, right? Right, why? Well, uh, because that's the season that we're still in. I mean, it just is. Uh, the, ground, the ground is not yet quite steady under our feet. It just, it just isn't. S still a little shaky. Um, and, and, and this season, of course, has been a little bit more shaky than most. Uh, no doubt about it. But, but here's something else that's also true. Um, things are never really as steady as they seem. Not really. I mean, sometimes we're able to go a long time without a crisis or something that makes our life uncertain. Uh, and I think we're all hoping that 2021 continues to kind of trend that way, uh, a little bit more normal. Sometimes, sometimes we get longer periods of normal. Uh, but, but even in those times, even in those times, uh, we're, not, we're not really in control of what happens um, or, or what happens to us. We, we don't know what, what tomorrow holds. And, and not, to be, not to be Debbie Downer here, um, but after this season of shaky ground is over, and it will be, and it will be, there'll be another one. I mean, maybe not like worldwide pandemic level shaky, hopefully, but I mean, in our individual lives, shaky, for sure, for sure. And it's kind of an interesting parallel to where we're at in the Christian calendar. Um, we're in a period that's called Lent, and it actually started a couple of weeks ago. But, but Lent is the period of 40 days that leads up to Good Friday, the day that we remember what Jesus did on the cross. And in uh, the last 40 days of Jesus' life before the cross, as he journeyed not only toward his death, but as really his God-given purpose, um, as he fixed his eyes on what he knew his father had put him on earth to do, to give his life as a, as a ransom, to buy us all back from the power of sin. In those last 40 days, Jesus had to navigate some pretty shaky ground, <laughs> pretty unsteady ground. So what we're going to do is we're just going to dive into Jesus' story and we're going to walk along, alongside of him and through some of the more shaky times in his life and, and shaky relationships in his life. Uh, this is actually where we're going to be journeying for the next few weeks as a, as a church through a series that we're calling Shaky Ground, Steady Eyes. Shaky Ground, Steady Eyes. And so on the TV next to me, you can kind of see how the series plays out. But for each of these four weeks, we're essentially looking at a different relationship in Jesus' life where, he, where he, he walked with his eyes fixed on, on his purpose, but, but walked on some pretty shaky ground and some pretty shaky relationships. And so, so from backwards to forwards, here's where we're going. Uh, four weeks from today, which is going to be 
Palm Sunday, that weekend, we're going to be taking a look at the crowds. Uh, crowds that shouted Hosanna and welcomed him as king just a few days later then shouted crucify him as they, they watched him die before, before their very eyes, okay? Um, week before that, we're gonna be looking at Peter and, and, and specifically at Peter's denial. And then next week, we're gonna be looking at the story of Lazarus whom Jesus raises from the dead. But ironically, this is also the same moment that people who w- were Jesus' enemies decided that they were gonna plot to kill him, same, same day. And of course then, uh, which leads us to, uh, to this weekend, as we kick off the series, week number one, this weekend we're gonna be looking at Judas Iscariot, um, one of the more infamous relationships in Jesus' life and one of the shakiest, I think most unsteady moments in Jesus' life as well. When, uh, when one of his closest followers, Judas, a man who had left everything for the last three years to follow him, decides to betray him to his death, okay? And, and, and Judas's story is documented in John 12 and 13, and we're gonna get there eventually, but go ahead and just find that if you like right now. And, and, and just in case you don't have access to a Bible wherever you're kind of joining us from, um, we're gonna have several verses on the screen for you to kind of follow along, but we really do encourage you to get in it yourself on your phone, or if you got your own, great. Um, it's just a really good habit to get into. John 12 and 13. So as, as you find that, let me just catch you up on where, where, where you're gonna be jumping into in the story of Jesus. I'm gonna do that with a picture here. Um, John 13 exists right here. This is the moment we're gonna be looking at where Judas betrays Jesus. Here's what's going on. It's, thir- it's a Thursday evening, we think, and Jesus is celebrating something called the Passover. That's the moment. All right. The Passover is this is this uh, annual ceremony where where Jewish people remembered God delivering them from the bonds of slavery in Egypt, and Jesus was sharing the centerpiece of the Passover celebration, which was a meal, and he was he was doing that with his disciples, his, these twelve guys. It's 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 not unlike um, fireworks on the Fourth of July for us, right? Like it's the pinnacle of of Independence Day and we remember what happened as the fireworks go off is what we look for. This is what this is essentially what Passover is for Jesus and his friends. Now for us as followers of Jesus, we look back on this day not as the Passover, we look back on it as the Last Supper. Same meal becomes known for us as the Last Supper because it was Jesus' last meal before later that night he gets arrested. Okay? That's those are handcuffs. (laughs) <laughs> but <laughs> it's pretty good, right? Uh, Jesus gets arrested that night, and then the, then the next day, Friday at 3, Jesus is crucified. Less than 24 hours later from the story we're going to read. But, but, but the crazy thing is, just, just five days prior to this moment in John 12 and 13, just five days prior, it's Sunday, and Jesus is coming into Jerusalem on a donkey, and people are laying down palm branches. That's what that is. How about that? Um, but as a symbol of, they're, 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 they're welcoming him as a king. And then in just a day before that, we get to a story where in John 12, where all of this kind of kicks off, um, what puts all of these events in motion is something that happens Saturday, six days prior uh, in a little town called Bethany where Jesus is at the house of his three closest friends. And John tells us the story of these three friends of Jesus. It was a man named Lazarus, the same guy who he raised from the dead, and two of his sisters, Mary and Martha, and while Jesus is in their home, what Mary does is she takes a very expensive jar of perfume. That's what those are perfume fumes. I don't know. Um, but that's what's happening. Mary, she, she takes this really expensive jar of perfume and she anoints Jesus' head with it. When I say very expensive, I mean, here's what I mean. Like a year's salary expensive. Um, and as Judas, one of the 12, watches this happen, it's like the last straw for him. Um, so t- t- take a look at the story here in John 12, verse four. Here's how Judas responds. He says, uh, John tells us, one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, he objected to what Mary was doing. And he says, this is Judas saying it, why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. And he goes on to say, John says, Judas didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but 
because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to, to what was put into it. That's what John says. Um, a lot of other gospel writers are picking up on the same th- story. When I say gospel writers, people who just, who told some of the similar stories about who Jesus is and what he did. So Mark, um, a- as he shares some of the same story in his gospel, he writes this, he, he, he captures the story, and then he writes this immediately after. The, then Judas Iscariot, one of the 12, immediately after this, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. And they were delighted to hear this, and they promised to give him money, so he watched for an opportunity to to hand him over. And, and then another gospel writer, Luke. Uh, Luke uh, fills in some more of the blanks to what Mark just shared here. This is from Luke 22 now. Here's what Luke says. Now the festival of unleavened bread called the Passover, same thing, was approaching and the chief priests of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus for they were afraid of the people. And here's what, here's what Luke says. Then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, one of the 12, and Judas went to the chief priest. In fact, John, where we started, he picks up on the same thing. John 13 says this, 13 two, the evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. And then just a, first, a, a few verses later in John 13, we get the moment where he does exactly that. You know, uh, we're, we're familiar with stories of betrayal. You know, Jesus dips the, dips the bread in the, in the cup and he gives it to, to, to Judas and, and, and that's the signal that Judas is the one who's gonna betray him and Judas goes out. And he, we're familiar with stories like that. <laughs> um, in fact, uh, they're the most downloaded, consumed podcasts and Netflix series out there. Stories just like this one. Uh, Making of a Murderer. Um, Tiger King right? Serial, the podcast. Uh, things, get, things like this get pretty popular pretty quickly. Uh, they get embedded in pop culture and our national consciousness pretty, pretty quickly. Why is that? Why is this story 2,000 years later, stories like, why do they get so, why are they so infamous? Well, I think, I think a couple of reasons. Uh, one, we, we, as we look and we just feel like we, we have to make sense of it. He just doesn't make, how could someone do that? And, and what was their motive and why was that? We, we, we feel compelled to solve the riddle. And so we go and we listen and we go and we watch and we download and we consume. But, but the other reason I think they're so popular, these stories like this, they're so popular is this. Most of us feel like we, we would just never do that. We just could never do that. It doesn't, it doesn't hit home for us. We feel like we're so far removed from something like this that we can just kind of consume it in whatever format it, it, it comes to us. Uh, it's just a series. It's, it's just a podcast. It's just a movie. It's just a book. Um, it's, it's an interesting way to pass the time. I mean, even if it's a true story with real people, it's not our story. I'd never do what Carol Baskin did, which she totally did, by the way. <laughs> um, and so we just consume it, right? We consume it like anything else. And, and I, think, uh, I think that we're in a little bit of danger here when we look at Judas's story uh, of falling into that way of thinking. Um, the mistake, I think, would be to, uh, to interact with it like it's a story that could never be our story. That would be the mistake. Because here's the thing about Judas, okay? Judas responded to Jesus' call to come follow me. Judas left his whole life, literally, to follow Jesus, literally. I mean, Judas spent three years going to church 24-7, He heard every sermon Jesus ever preached. He witnessed every miracle Jesus ever performed. He had a front row seat to the Son of God in the flesh. Um, I mean, before Judas was the betrayer, Judas was one of the 12. He was one of us. 
So I, it would be a mistake, I think, to, to, to look at his story like it, like it couldn't be us when he was one of us. I, I think here's the question we probably should be asking ourselves as we dive into Judas's story, and that's this. What was the shaky ground in Judas's life? How did it get there? And, and, and is that the same shaky ground in mine? That's what we really should be asking. What was going on in his life and, and his, whatever was going on in his life, is that going on in mine? Because if we can answer that question, we'll be able to know whether or not we should pay more attention to this story. I think what we're gonna find is the stuff that was in Judas's life absolutely is in our own. It's easy to look at the moment of betrayal and conclude that, you know, never in a million years would I do that. It's easy to do that. It's just that I'm, I'm sure Judas thought the exact same thing. In fact, after Judas watches what happens to Jesus as a result of his betrayal, Judas is so overcome with guilt and shame that he ends his own life. Never in a million years did he think he'd wind up doing a deal with murderers for the life of an innocent man. Never in a million years. So what was this shaky ground that was in Judas's life? How did, how did he get there? Um, and, and then what can we draw out from his story so that we can check and see whether or not that same shaky ground might be in our own? I, th three things I wanna draw out from, from this, okay? Um, first thing is this. Judas, Judas kept his sin hidden, okay? Kept it hidden. Here's the deal. All of us have sin in our life. All of us. Every single one of us. From the, from the shiniest, most Christ-like example to the, to the worst sinner out there. All of us have sin in our life. It's all part of our story. For Judas, it was greed. That was his deal. Um, he loved money. He loved what it afforded him. Uh, that was his sin, which is a pretty common one, honestly. I mean, a lot of us have that as part of our sin story, right? Probably for him, started small, just like it does for all of us. Now, Judas let that sin go unchecked to the point where he was defrauding his friends. Um, and, and, and I'm guessing he was racked with guilt the first few times that he did those things, you know, but just like any habit, it kind of gets easier as you go. And that's what sin does, by the way. Um, one of my favorite Pastor John-isms. Sin will take you further than you want to go, and it'll keep you longer than you want to stay. I remember hearing that as an 18 or 19 year old. It's true of Judas's story too. Hidden sin is shaky ground. Hidden sin is shaky ground. It's like a, it's like a crack in your foundation. If you don't address it by confessing to God, getting it out in the light, talking about it with someone else, what it'll do, like a crack in the foundation, it'll just grow and grow and grow until the ground underneath your life gives way. Hidden sin leads to shaky ground, number, number one, okay? On to the second. This is true of Judas's story too. Judas, he covered up his sin with religion. That's what he did. He covered it up with religion. See, rather than just bringing it onto the light and confessing it, rather than saying something like, you guys, this, I just, this is embarrassing. Um, pains me to tell you this. Some of you probably already suspected it, but I can't keep it hidden any longer. I've, I've, been, uh, I've been stealing. And I'm very sorry, and I would understand if I'm out of this group, but I just, I couldn't hold it any longer, right? Which would have been a painful thing to say. Not only does he not say that, what he does was he covers it up with religion. He covers it up by just saying the right thing. Uh, oh, we could have given that money to the poor, you know? Well, it was a very nice sentiment, very religious sentiment, tough to argue with on the surface, right? Judas covered up his hidden sin with, with religion. And that's what religion is, ultimately. It's just a system of, of beliefs and sayings and, and practices that largely remain disconnected 
from your heart. And they fail to really change who we actually are from the inside out. That's religion. And you know what? Um, here's what I found. The people who scream the loudest about their religious convictions are often the same people who are using those convictions to cover up some hidden sin. And, and it, it would be easy to cite some of the more public and, and, and famous examples of this, certainly in the church world, you know, from televangelists of the 80s like the Jimmy Swaggerts or the megachurch pastors of today, um, Mark Driscoll, James McDonald, Bill Hybels, uh, most recently, I don't know if you caught this or not, but Ravi Zacharias. Some of us maybe haven't heard that one, but stories like that all over the place. And again, you know, we, we hear those names and we read those stories like, um, like they could never be us, you know? Like I could never do what that person did. But come, I mean, come on, come on. We're kidding ourselves if we read those and go, I'd never do that. We're kidding ourselves. I mean, what do, you, what do you think led up to these things? What do you think led up to this in Judas's life? I mean, it's just, it's the, the same things that are creating the shaky ground in Judas's life and these megachurch pastors that are, that are in our own. Same, same things. Um, hidden sin, number one. Covered up by religion, number two. Third and final one, I think. Third and final one. Judas opened himself up to, uh, to the enemy's voice and also the enemy's lies. And, and by the way, this is what hidden, uncovered, covered up, uh, excuse me, hidden, covered up sin, this is what hidden and covered up sin opens you up to. You hide your sin, you cover it up, you're gonna be opening yourself up to the enemy's voice which is always a voice of lies. Kind of an uncomfortable thing to talk about in 2021, the devil, right? Um, this idea that we really do have an enemy, Satan, who is real and who really interacts with us. I, I understand it's kind of an awkward, uncomfortable idea for some of us, but I just, I, I believe that he is real. And I believe that he operates the same way today as he did with Judas. Same way with Judas as he does with us. I think when we keep our sin hidden like Judas, I think when we cover it up with our religion like Judas, I think we, like Judas, open ourselves up to the enemy's voice. And, and the enemy whispers two things to Judas, okay? Two things in the spot. First thing he whispers is, hey, uh, life with Jesus is not better than the life you can secure for yourself. That was the first thing he whispers. Hey, Judas, you're following this Jesus around. You don't got a home. There's no real security. It's no wonder you're skimming from the top, you know. And, and look at him. He's fine with this reckless generosity, I guess. But it's money out of your pocket. And, 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 and so Jesus, Jesus is a threat to the life that you really want. That's the first thing, first lie that, that the enemy whispers to Judas. Because, because why? Because Jesus is the life. Jesus, Jesus is the true life. Je Jesus really is the life that Judas ultimately wanted. But the enemy had whispered to him and lied to him. And in that spot, Judas listens. He's pretty deep. He's created an elaborate front to cover all of his sin up. And now the enemy's voice is making some pretty good sense to him. So Judas listens and he, and he follows through and he betrays Jesus. Now afterward, Judas is stricken by the full force of what he's done as he watches this man brutally murdered publicly. And it's at this point the enemy whispers the second lie to Judas and he says uh, 
There's no recovering from this. There's no forgiveness for this. There's no redemption from this. I mean, you think the Son of God is gonna forgive you for betraying him? No. Judas, this world is better off without you. And Judas listens to this lie as well. And Judas agrees. And so Judas takes his own life. Both were lies. Both were lies because not only is Jesus the true life, Judas wasn't beyond redemption. That was a lie too. See, same day, same day that Judas does what he does, Peter, another one of the 12, does almost the same exact thing that Judas did. Judas betrays Jesus. Peter denies ever knowing him. Judas put Jesus in a position to be arrested. Peter refuses to come to Jesus' aid once he is arrested. But one guy kills himself while the other just sobs bitterly but finds himself running to a tomb that's empty three days later. What's the difference? Well, the difference is this truth, okay? You're only beyond redemption if you buy into the enemy's lie that you are. This is the truth. You're only beyond redemption if you buy into that lie. The truth is, there is no hidden sin that Jesus hasn't already paid for or can't forgive. There's no, there's nothing secret, buried, covered up that Jesus doesn't already know about, hasn't already paid for, and is just unwilling to forgive. The question for us from Judas' story this weekend, the question, the question is this, which side of the line do you want to live on? Do you want to live on this side of the line where you're, you're under the thumb of your hidden sin, you know, desperately trying to cover it up, vulnerable to the lies of the enemy? Is that where you want to be? Or do you want to be on the side of the line that admits to God and yourself and everyone else admits who you really are, admits what you really need, and most importantly, admits who Jesus is really. I want to pray for us to that end, okay? Let's do that. Father, as I read Judas' story, I know I'm a breath away from it. And I also know, God, 
that a lot of us feel like Judas's story, the shaky ground that was in Judas's life is the same shaky ground that's in ours. God, I am asking you to bust through the lie of the enemy with the truth of your son Jesus this weekend and help us take a step across the line, out from under the bondage of hidden and covered up sin and the enemy's lies into the redemption that could only be found in your son, Jesus. And Jesus, I do pray this in your name. Amen. Amen.